hardening. Um, but we're going to introduce this other kind of hardening called kinematic hardening. And then to make things even more fun, we're going to mix them up. Okay, we're going to combine them. So the, the rationale or the the uh, and I never know if I'm spelling this right. Um, the motivation for introducing kinematic hardening is that in reality many materials uh, experience a sort of degradation in their load unload cycles. Okay, so if you look at concrete, uh, rocks, many materials, and I think even steel for that matter, if you cyclically load them, you know, as you pull and then you come back down and compress, the yield strength of that material will just be lower. Okay, that's, that's just a phenomenological observation. So if you think about it in the context of our uh, 2D model, so here's your initial yield strength in tension. You go past that, you go into plasticity, okay? And then as you come back down in the unload branch, okay, with the, with the slope of E, right? Whatever you push back up by will be subtracted from whatever you had before. So let's say this is the amount of strength you had, this is how much you pushed. So this will be your new yield strength, essentially. So as you come down, as you hit that value of stress now in compression, right? That's when you go into plasticity now. Okay? And the same will be true for the tension part. So as far as we push, whatever we push down here on the strength, whatever change in the strength we've made, call it delta sigma y, will be penalized from whatever you had on the other side. Okay, so tension compression is not really important. Is whatever you pull, you have to give, give up on the compression side and vice versa. Okay, so you can see these, the way I rationalize it is that there is a zero, a zero sum game in terms of strength. You either utilize it in tension or in compression, and that's it, okay? So this motivated people to introduce new kind of models that introduce this new kind of hardening law, law called kinetic hardening, kinematic, I'm sorry, kinematic. And we did a little bit of that in 1D. Now we do it in multi-D. So what kinematic hardening is, is, is fairly simple conceptually. It gets hard, a little bit harder in terms of uh, the math, especially in multi-D. So what it is, is you, know, you, you always start center at the hydrostatic axis, say the J2 model. So here's your initial. Uh, yield strength or your initial cylinder coming out at you out of the page. And what kinematic hardening enables the cylinder to do is that it enables it to shift. But it doesn't enable it to rotate about the hydrostatic axis and it doesn't enable it to expand or contract. It just enables it to shift. Okay? The axis of the cylinder always remain parallel to the axis of a hydrostatic axis, okay? They're always collinear in that sense. But they're not, not collinear, I'm sorry, parallel. All right, so if I were to embark into a stress path of any sort that pushes past the yield strength, let's say here, the only possibility for the model now is to move here. So my new yield my new yield surface now is here. Okay, and if the original center of the yield surface was here, now that center is it looks like a plausible new center is here. 
So you have given the model a new degree of freedom where you enable it to shift its center. Okay? That new degree of freedom is afforded by a, a quantity that we're going to call alpha. It's a tensor. And it's the same guy that we met before. It's your back stress. Right? The NA essentially controls where the center of your yield surface is. Alpha at the beginning is zero, then it evolves here. Kappa, the uh, radius of your yield surface is constant. It's the same kappa as you have in the initial condition. So the cylinder is not growing or expanding, it's just shifting by action of alpha. So this is a shift. All right, so in the kinematic model, kappa is constant, right? In the isotropic model, kappa was allowed to grow, right? So the radius was allowed to grow, but the center remained fixed. Now this one, the center is allowed to move around, the radius is fixed. Alpha uh, uh, is equal to zero initially, And it's called the back stress. And the trace of alpha, as you <coughs> probably suspect, is zero. So alpha is deviatory. In other words, think about it. Alpha only lives on a deviatory plane. It cannot have any component on the volumetric plane. Why? Because if it did, it would shift your cylinder not only up and down relative to the hydrostatic axis, but for instance, it would move it out this way as well. And that's not okay. That's not allowed. Okay? So alpha is only deviatory. Okay, that's its only component. Okay, so once we make this slight change, then we define my yield surface, my new yield surface F, as the L2 norm of something that I'm going to call C minus kappa equals zero, with the only difference that that C is S minus alpha. Now, <clears throat> let's say, just for the sake of argument, let's say that I didn't land there. Let's say I landed here, just to be able to do better graphics. Okay, so my S is this guy. That's the projection of my sigma at that point on the deviatory plane, right? So I see S as this vector, right? And if you pay attention, C then is this guy, right? It's your vector, it's a radial vector on this plane, okay? It always emanates from the center of your yield surface, or from the axis of your yield surface, to the point of stress you're at. Okay? And <coughs> of course, the magnitude of that guy has to be kappa. And that's what this says. Okay? So, that's it. That's, that's the whole uh, game that we're going to be playing. So, if you look at C, C itself is traceless. C itself is deviatoric. <coughs> and people give it a name. You could call it the relative stress.
Yeah, so kinematic model says all, what, all that matters for yielding is not exactly where I am. Think about it. In the, in the isotropic model, all that matters is where you are. Where is my sigma? I take, the, I take the projection of that sigma onto the deviatoric plane. Right? That gives me S. I take the strength of that vector. If that strength is bigger than kappa, you yield. In the kinematic model, you say that's not, I don't care. S can be 1,000, 10,000, 100,000. It's magnitude. doesn't matter. What matters is the relative distance between S and the center of the new space. That's what matters in this moment. And that's what creates this effect, right? The moment you've pushed up here, right, you have moved the center of your yield surface to accommodate for that, right? And therefore, your center now is at a different place. It used to be here. Now it's somewhere up here, right? Therefore, when you come back down, the relative distance from that center is a different one, okay? And therefore, you yield different. Okay, let's keep going. So, if we want to look at consistency, as we always do, we need to take care of f dot. So, the L2 norm of this, the time derivative of this, is always going to be 1 half, uh, 1 over the L2 norm of this, right? And then you multiply this, well, there's no multiplication, this is a scalar, by C dot, right? Is that right? Yeah, right, that's, that's okay. That's okay. Um, minus now kappa dot equals zero, and you know that this guy is zero in this particular model. I did something wrong, guys. This is not right. The reason why this is not right, well, let's just do it in initial notation so we can all get it right. Um, so this translates into the L2 norm of this is C double contracted with C one half. That's the L2 norm minus kappa. And then you see why I made a mistake. There are two C's there, so uh, we didn't take care of one of them. So the dot product of this whole thing, or the, I'm sorry, the, the, the time derivative of this whole thing tells you one half C double contracted with C minus one half. That was the term that I had written before. But then you pick up a two times C double contracted with C. One of them, you need to take a time derivative of, okay? And you get that two term because you have uh, symmetry. So these two, and then you get minus kappa dot, which is zero, and all of that has to go. Now, now we're in business. So what do we have here? The twos go, and you get that f dot gives you something that looks like c double contracted with c dot, over this guy, which is essentially the L2 norm of C. Okay, so it's the contraction of C dot <laughs> with a unit tensor in the, in the direction of C dot. Okay. And we're going to call that guy, is this? No, this is not the place where we give him a name. We just say that this is equal to zero, right, by consistency. So what this is telling you is that, you know, you're going to have a, a, a tensor that is a unit tensor in a certain direction. Whatever your increment is in the, in the relative stress, it has to be orthogonal to that previous, uh, to, to that uh, uh, unit tensor C over its, its own magnitude in order for it to be all consistent with the plasticity model that you have, right? That's, that's the constraint, 
then you say, all right, but C is S minus alpha. So this means that C dot over the L2 norm of itself, not C dot, just C over the L2 norm of itself, double contraction with S dot minus alpha dot dies <laughs> And then we define n hat to be this unit tensor, just as we did before with s over s, the other norm of s. It's a definition, it's a name. And we get that n hat sigma dot, s dot has to be equal to n hat. This is my consistency condition. The way I interpret it is S cannot evolve in whatever way it wants. What that's telling me is that the projection of the change of S onto the N hat tensor has to be equivalent or the same to the projection of the change in alpha or the backstretch onto that same direction. They have to evolve together in a way that whatever projection they make on this, for now, kind of obscure in hand, has to be the same. Okay? They cannot just do whatever they want. They, this imposes a rule of evolution for both of them. Okay? All right. But, we note that n hat double contracted with s dot is the same as n hat double contracted with sigma dot. Why is that? Right, because n is deviatoric, and every time you hit a deviatoric tensor with a non deviatoric tensor, or with a general tensor, all you extract out of them is their deviatory component. Okay, so the only component of sigma dot that really interacts with n hat is the S component. The P component, the pressure component is always zero. Anyway, so. Okay, so this means that by the consistency that this is true. Okay, now, df d sigma is equal to df dc, which is really the term, the variable that appears on f, dc d sigma by the chain. Okay? Um, so, um, if you take a look at the first term, df dc is, we've, we've gone through this before, when we took df ds before, remember? And we had the L2 norm of S here. So we know what that gives you back. This always gives you back and half. But remember, now and half is defined as this. Okay. So this we know the result of. So this becomes n hat double contracted with c d c uh, d, d of uh, c with respect to sigma. This will be where is uh, c s minus alpha. Okay, this will boil down to n hat, what am I doing? n hat double contracted with whatever this turns out to be. Because alpha is not a function of, of sigma, it's independent. But we already know this. What is this? 
the, the, the deviatory part of a tensor derived with respect to, to the tensor itself. Do you remember what it was? <coughs> Okay, you need to start working on these things because you're going to need them for your project. This is a deviatoric projection. Okay. That fourth order identity tensor, remember, it was the, not not fourth order identity tensor, it was the, the fourth order identity tensor minus a term that had the, the one third, uh, ident uh, the chronic delta diet, chronic delta that guy. Okay, so this whole business here gives you n half, right? Because when I hit a deviatoric tensor with the deviatoric projection, I just get back the vector, the tensor itself. Which is so, right. So, so, okay, so now I know where I get n half. So, I get that BF, the sigma, double contracted with sigma dot, is equal to n hat, double contracted with sigma dot, is equal to n hat, double contracted with alpha dot. All of these things are true. Yes, no, maybe? Are we okay? We're on the same page? Or am I losing you? I want to explain again yes. why the uh, alpha, the sigma is zero. Alpha, which one? Where are you looking at? The transition from the line below. Here? Yeah, that equals minus 10 from the center. From here to here? Right. Ah. So, so that has to do with the derivative of alpha with respect to sigma being zero. And that has to do with the fact that alpha is independent of sigma. Okay. So whatever, whatever sigma changes uh, you have, it, it has nothing to do on, on, on alpha in general. Now, you could argue and say, well, but you just told us that alpha has to evolve more or less with respect to s. But that doesn't make it directly depending on sigma, because remember, sigma has two degrees of freedom. One is in the s direction, and the other one is in the hydrostatic direction. So in general, a change in sigma doesn't imply a change in alpha. That's why that derivative is there. Now, a change in sigma is always related to uh, a change in S. There's, there is a, a close form derivative, but, but the same is not true for us, not necessarily. Okay. So they, they, they're, they're independent of each other. Okay, and you will see as we give the rule for how alpha evolves. Remember that before we said that one of the principles of plasticity, this is another way to see it, is that the plastic internal variables, here the plastic internal variables alpha, evolve independent of the elastic processes. Sigma is dependent on an elastic process. So whatever happens with sigma never commutes with what happens with alpha, and the, and the, and the opposite is also true. Okay, there's a separation between elasticity processes and plasticity. So there is something called the Prager translation rule. And what that says is that alpha dot equals h epsilon dot p. So this takes you back again to this idea that evolutions of alpha or plastic internal variables, only depend on plastic processes. All right, and then if you use the flow rule, then this becomes this, right, by the flow rule. Yes, and we just found that this is H lambda dot n hat. or 
sometimes you see it written as lambda dot h <coughs> and hat. It doesn't really matter. So again, I like to think of vectors, and this gives me the magnitude of the vector change in alpha. And this always gives me the direction. This points in the direction, and then this scales it. Okay, the more plasticity I have, the more plastic strain I have, the more alpha dot I need to have. Okay, also the higher H is, the, the bigger this guy is gonna be. As H approaches zero, perfect plasticity, it's harder for alpha to change, to move. And if you go back to a static, rigid, cylinder that doesn't want to go anywhere. The more plasticity you have, the more that cylinder has to move. Think about it. Okay, so there are all these geometric interpretations of all these things. Okay. okay, so, but now we go back up here and we say, okay, according to this, then n hat double contracted with sigma dot equals now well, n hat double contracted with n hat is 1. So I conclude that f dot equals, as before, df d sigma double contracted with n hat, with, with, with sigma dot, I'm sorry, minus h lambda dot, and all of that has to be equal to 0. It's, remember that before we had this? This is true, this, consist, this form of a consistency condition is true for pretty much all of the models that I know. F dot is always equal to the change of alpha with respect to sigma times the change of sigma in time minus the hardening modulus times the, the plastic multiplier. All of that is equal to zero. Here we we got it by putting together all of the all of the uh, all of the ingredients. This guy here in this model is n hat in the J2 model. It was also n hat, but with a slightly different definition of n hat. It was say s over the norm of s. Then the moment you have n hat double contracted with sigma dot, that reads n hat double contracted with s dot. Right? And then this guy here, right, according to the Fraga rule, right, he boils down to essentially this guy. Okay. <clears throat> so you can put all the pieces together, but you always land. Okay. So this is equivalent to n hat double contracted with sigma dot. Minus yeah. and <coughs> That's what I'm trying to say. And that is equal to zero. Okay, they're the same thing. This is also F dot. Questions? This is a more difficult model, so ask your questions now. No, okay. All right. Okay, so. Of course, 
with various anisotropic model and there's a kinematic model, there's probably a combined model. Okay. Especially when you look at them by what they are. So in the isotropic model, you have some kappa dot equals h lambda dot, right? And alpha dot, if you will, is equal to alpha equal to zero. It doesn't play any role in the isotropic model. In fact, you don't even write it. In the kinematic model, kappa dot is always zero, right? And alpha dot is said to change as lambda dot h and dot. So some smart guy somewhere thought, well, why not combine? <laughs> uh, it looks like an easy linear combination uh, to make. So someone introduced the beta parameter, which says, yeah, right. let kappa dot equal beta h lambda dot. And then if you do that with kappa, then this one is 1 minus beta lambda dot h and half. Set beta equal to 1, you get the isotropic hardening. Set beta equals to uh, 0, you get kinematic hardening, right? Set it in between those two values, you get some combination of the two. Why not? <laughs> so instead of, imp at least from an implementational point of view, we don't know what the model is going to do in between, but at least from an implementation point of view, if we just make beta a binary choice, 0, 1, we know that we don't have to implement two models, we just implement one and we are ready to go. But then from a modeling point of view, the possibility of having a combined hardening rule might bring about some interesting physics that we might not be able to capture with just one or the other. Now we just need to make sure that we can handle this beta. Okay, we're, we're down to the control uh, problem. So I've been, I've been reading this interesting um, uh, book called uh, Superintelligence, and it talks about uh, what happens when you introduce new things and you don't know what their implication is going to be. And the guy makes a, a very nice uh, story at the beginning to motivate that there's this group of sparrows you know, the birds that one day decide that it would be great to recruit an owl, you know, to do many of the tasks that they, they have to do. You know, owls are great, they're powerful, you know, they're, they're great uh, birds, right, compared to sparrows. So, but then there is a group of them that is not totally convinced, right? They say, well, wait, but how are we going to control the owl? <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> sounds like a great idea, but, you know, who's going to talk to this guy, and you know, how do we make sure that this, the owl does what we want it to do? And um, many things in life, and plasticity is no difference, it's like that. It's like that. Uh, you know, you, you introduce this new parameter beta, sounds great, but what are the implications? Can we control beta? Um, okay, so, so from... Um, Geometrical point of view, I like I like to do this on this board so I have more space. Isotropic looks like this. I'm gonna try to make sure that yeah. So I'm centered here, <coughs> sigma one, sigma two, sigma three, and then I can speak of sigma 2 versus, say, epsilon 2. So if I am going to increase, <coughs> let's say, sigma 2 in some way, and by the way, this is my yield stress at this point. So I come up linearly, so maybe I take this path. Uniaxial test, maybe, or 
something at least that projects like that. I hit the yield surface. The only way I can continue to increase, let's say, continue on this path in the J2 isotropic hardening model is for the model to expand. So this is my new yield surface. And this is my new yield strength. Kinematic, on the other hand, can do the same. Starts looking like the same. Your surface centered, the hydrostatic axis, and now I'm going to have to move this now. There's a space, sigma 2, epsilon 2, okay, perhaps I move along this line, okay, again. <coughs> From here. Then if I want to keep pushing, my yield surface doesn't expand, it moves. So whatever amount I move that way, that's the amount that alpha had to move. Remember, that's what this says. Change sigma, project it onto the deviatoric plane, that's exactly the same amount that alpha has to change. In fact, this projection is kind of, well, it's not kind of, it's exactly trivial in this case because alpha dot is already in the n hat direction. So this, this double contraction is kind of pointless, okay? But this one does make a difference. Okay, so that means that alpha had to change by this amount, so I'm just gonna write it here. This guy is alpha. Right? And now your center is here and your yield surface is perhaps there. Okay? You still with me? And so say I stop there. And for some reason, I changed my mind and I decide to unload. So now I start going in this other direction. Everything will be okay. I'll get past the zero point. And then I have an alpha. Yeah. Is it alpha? No, I don't know what, what exactly it is. Some amount until I hit the yield surface. Again. So this will look like this. Then it will start going into a system. These two points correspond to each other. And then if I'm to push down, then this guy has to shift down, right? And I can continue to drag it down, but then alpha has to move along it. Get that? So imagine your yield surface being a balloon. In the isotropic case, your yield surface inflates as your finger touches the surface of the yield surface. As soon as I touch the surface, the surface starts to inflate everywhere. That's how I can continue to move my finger up. In the kinematic case, your finger says to push the surface. The kinematic model enables the surface to come along with your finger. It's not inflating, it's just being dragged along. Okay. And then in the combined case, things get more interesting. Let's do it here. So this is the combo. I say loading here. Signal one, signal two, signal 
3, in the elastic initially, everything is fine. <coughs> then I start pushing with my finger, and I want to go up. Well, now I have two mechanisms, right? My balloon, my yield surface is being dragged up, but it's also inflating, depending on how much I have of each. Okay? So, I could have the following situation, where I just have a larger balloon centered higher, but that perhaps its bottom part touches the bottom part of the original yield surface. You can imagine constructing something like that, where now this is alpha, but kappa has also changed. This is my original kappa, say kappa naught. This is my new kappa, current kappa. So, in that case, I will go into plasticity here until I touch this point. And then if for some reason I decide to stop, and now I unload, I will be able to go until I hit the yield surface again. Whatever that is. So notice that in this combined case, so let's just do this. So <coughs> let's look at the ramifications. We didn't unload here. Let's unload it. <coughs> so we are to unload here. We go past the initial yield strength. Nothing happens, right? I can keep going <coughs> elastically until here, and then I start going plus. So, isotropic, every time I push the boundaries, I get rewarded, I get stronger. Kinematic, every time I push the boundary, I don't get rewarded. I have a finite amount of strength, whatever I put on the plus side, I need to take from the minus side. Combined, well, it's a combination. You have you push in the boundary, you are getting stronger as much as the isotropic model allows you to, to get, plus you're shifting the, the boundary. So for instance, in this particular case that we sketched here, if this was sigma y naught of sorts to abuse the notation, this would be minus sigma y naught. So in this case that we concocted, Right? Whatever strength we gain by inflating the, um, the yield surface right, was compensated by the amount we lost by shifting it up. So we ended up being as strong as we were in tension as in compression. Now that's for the first cycle. In the subsequent cycles, we will get stronger, probably, right? Because we... The, the isotropic <coughs> condition keeps growing and growing. For as, for as far as we're hardening, this thing will keep growing. Okay. So this is it, okay? This is the, the, the sort of the conceptual uh, picture, okay? Now let's do consistency because it's the only change in the whole thing. And then we will integrate this model once and for all. So consistency. Again, consistency always means F dot equal to zero. Okay, now it's it's the yield surface by the way, it's the same one. Same thing. Now F dot equals zero. Let's do this. So it's DF, D, 
c c dot minus uh, d f d kappa or yeah sure uh, kappa dot equals zero. Now I cannot just throw that term away. This happens just to be a trivial. So there's a plus, and then this becomes minus one. So, um, okay, we know that this is n hat, double contracted with uh, c dot, minus kappa dot equals zero. So far, so good, right? Then I open the hood of uh, C dot, right? And I let this guy be what it is, which is S dot minus alpha dot minus kappa dot. So minus. And um, this is where the fun begins, right? This is where the combined model kicks in. And now I have n hat double contracted with s dot minus n hat double contracted with alpha dot, which is this in the combined model. So it's one minus beta lambda dot h n hat minus beta h lambda dot. All of that zero. You still with me? Great. Um, I get the n hat with the n hat and all I get is one, right? And then I note that the minus beta lambda dot h with the other minus sign here will become plus and that will cancel out with this guy. And I get n hat double contracted with s dot minus lambda dot h has to vanish. And I land exactly where I started, n hat double contracted with sigma dot minus lambda dot h equals zero, which as usual, means that f dot equals df d sigma double contracted with sigma dot minus lambda dot h equals d. Also known as a canonical form for the consistency condition. Same as before. So no apparent change, at least from the point of view of consistency. So let's integrate this guy. <coughs> at least start. We did uh, the return mapping, right? And we did it for perfect plasticity, I believe. We didn't do it for, for any other. So now, now we're going to do it for, for all of it. So, given, you're always given your plastic internal variables, uh, your state of stress, and your new incremental uh, strength. Boom, right? So this is what, uh, we're, what we're going to call your state. So you know, and remember, you are discretizing time, Tn, and you want to know what's new in Tn plus 1, and you know, what takes you from one to the other is delta epsilon. So you assume that you know everything at time Tn, everything, the entire state. Plasticity, as, uh, in contrast to elasticity, is history dependent. You cannot know what is going to happen at time Tn plus 1 
if you didn't know what your state at the end is. Unlike elasticity, where your history doesn't matter, right? You just multiply whatever state of strain you have at that particular time, and up comes your stress. Here, the history matters, okay? So you have to be careful that you need to know the state. So, you start with your usual ingredients. Cook's look, as always, integrated. We're gonna do this one quickly, because we know this very well. Um, then, okay, we also know that This added to the composition of the strains. I combine the two things. Minus what we will always call the corrector, right? Ah. You write it well, you should see what. Trial state, corrected. Everything in the trial state is known. Right? You know your elasticity, you know your state of stress before, you know the new increment in strain, you don't know this thing. For that you need flow rule. Right? In all of these models that exist. Here you introduce your first approximation. Backward or then. Backward or inner says. Delta epsilon t equals delta lambda times n hat and n plus one. That's backward order. Forward order would say delta epsilon t equals delta lambda times n hat at n. Okay? It would be so much easier to implement. This guy, again, depends. This model is nasty. It depends on S. It depends on alpha. N hat looks innocent, but it's vicious. Okay, it's it's a function of many things. Plug it back in, right? Plug it back here. Well, you just found out. trial minus CE delta lambda and ah but I know what that is that's two mu remember it's just two mu because this guy is the elastic constants times some identity Matrices and those identity tensors are the only ones that interact with the hat in exactly the same way as they interacted with the n hat when it was s over the magnitude of s. There's nothing different. So this is two mu 
got the amount. And, ah, and then there was an enhanced surviving collision. That, that contraction. Just make sure that didn't have to end plus one. Yes, sir. Everything is in this Thank you for your money. Yes. So if I could only know what these two guys are, I'm done. I need these two guys. So let's keep digging. So what do you think? What what? So we've used hooks, additive recomposition, flow. <coughs> now what do you use? Consistency. Yeah, consistency is always your punchline. Four. Consistency. Or what you typically see people do. Um, so you either see them implement this form of consistency. Typically, this form of consistency, they use it for the continuum uh, form. When they're implementing algorithmically, you see them implement really this. You don't care so much about f dot being zero. You really care about f being zero. What f? f at n plus 1. You assume that f at n was already 0, or was fulfilled. What you really care about is the next step. So you really evaluate this. So let's do that. f at n plus 1 equals c at n plus 1 minus kappa at n plus 1. Now, all of them depend on that. So I start opening the hood, and I'm just going to follow my notes because I want to do the right thing. Let me go over here. I'm going to make this any more. So let's look at this. S at n plus 1, which I'm going to need to evaluate uh, C at n plus 1, equals sigma at n plus 1 minus 1 third, let's, let's just call it P, minus P at n plus 1 times identity. Remember? Um, now, Now, if you look at this here, uh, it's, where's it? Here, take a look at this. Uh, actually, this guy, this guy is the one. This is the more direct one. So let's, let's rewrite it here. Also, Sigma at n plus 1 equals sigma at n plus 1 trial minus 2 mu delta lambda n hat. Take the trace of this guy. So trace of sigma at n plus 1 equals trace of sigma at n plus 1 trial. Trace is just a linear operator, so it just goes turn by turn. Trace of this minus whatever the trace of this is. But what is the trace of this? Zero, right? Because n hat at n plus 1 or at any time is always zero. So as before, I get the, the property that the trace of sigma <coughs> n plus 1 is equal to the trace of sigma n plus 1 trial. That implies that s at n plus 1 trial equals to sigma <coughs> rn plus 1, or for now, let's just write this, minus, I can replace this guy with the, with the, with the trial, or vice versa. Do the same thing, because this guy is one-third the trace of that. Okay, so I'm just going to write it as this. So 
So this is what we've been calling the peak. <coughs> then, SRN plus 1 trial equals uh, sigma Rn plus 1 trial minus one third trace of sigma Rn plus 1. I'm purposely using the identity now, this identity. Instead of writing trial here, I'm just writing the, the, the actual thing. And now I'm going to subtract. Why not? OK? And I get S at n plus 1 equals S at n plus 1 trial. These two guys are going to cancel each other out. Correct? And then I'm going to get this minus this. So I'm going to get plus sigma n plus 1 minus sigma n plus 1 front. You still with me? <laughs> now I use this again. I know what sigma n minus sigma Rn plus 1 trial is. It's this guy. Right. So, S Rn plus 1 equals S Rn plus 1 trial minus 2 mu delta lambda and half. Right? Now, okay, so let's, let's keep this, and let's go back to the F term. So what we really want is to look at C n plus 1, because that's the term that enters here. Okay, so C at n plus 1 equals S at n plus 1 minus alpha at n plus 1, yes? That's the definition of, see, I just found out what SRN plus 1 is, is SRN plus 1 trial. By the way, uh, as in the usual way, the trial is completely known. It's just a trace of sigma n plus 1 trial. I'm sorry, the, the, the derivatory part of sigma n plus 1 trial. So this is known. Um, minus 2 mu delta lambda n hat at n plus 1. And then, okay, we start to use the hardening rule. So the hardening rule, do I want to do that here? Yes, let's do that. Um, says the following, right? It says, so let's do it up here before we, well, let's complete it here. I want to do it right here. Let's leave it like that for now. Okay, all I've done is replace, this is Sn plus 1. Look at alpha. So we were told alpha dot equals, where's my hardening rule? Um, alpha dot equals, in the combined model, this is 1 minus beta, um, minus beta h lambda dot n hat, right? Okay, use backward order. What are you going to get? Delta alpha equals 1 minus beta is a constant, doesn't matter. h is a constant, doesn't matter. Delta lambda n hat are in plus one. Recall this guy here is epsilon dot p. So in a way, we, all we did is just replace the integration of epsilon dot p, which we already did. Okay. So alpha n plus 1 equals alpha n plus this new thing, 
1 minus beta h delta lambda and hat at n plus 1. So let's use that now. So we use it here. Right? So we get C at n plus 1 equals S at n plus 1 trial <coughs> minus 2 mu delta lambda n hat at n plus 1 minus alpha at n plus 1, which is this guy. So I get minus alpha at n minus 1 minus beta h delta lambda n hat at n plus 1. Massive. Take a look at these two guys. If you had to give them a name when they're together, what would you call them? C and N plus one trial. C and N plus one trial, yes. So C and N plus one equals C and N plus one trial. Minus, and then you see that many things are common here. The delta lambda, the delta lambda is there, the n half, n plus 1 is there. So I'm going to get something that looks like minus <coughs> 2 mu plus 1 minus beta h delta lambda. Then I know that this guy is C at n plus 1 over its norm. And I'm going to collect terms in the usual way. I'm going to put this guy on the, right hand, on the left hand side. And I'm going to get that 1 plus 2 mu. <coughs> plus 1 minus beta times h, all of that over c n plus 1. When I multiply that by c n plus 1, that's equal to c n plus 1 charge. dropped the delta lambda, didn't I? Here. Okay. Big scalar, call it whatever you want, times a second order tensor equals some other second order tensor. What can I say about the two second order tensors? They're parallel. They're in the same direction. So, as before, it's the same thing to say this <coughs> than to say this. This guy is nothing but the unit tensor in the direction of the trial relative stress. So this guy is known. That's what this whole thing boils down to, right? It's it's known, it's always been known. We just didn't know. <laughs> um, furthermore, if we take Yes, 
if we take the L2 norms in both sides, okay, take the L2 norm here, take the L2 norm there, you get this stuff remains. <coughs> times this L2 norm equals this L2 norm. So I multiply things through and I realize that the L2 norm of n plus 1, the true thing, it's always equal to the L2 norm of a trial minus this term, 2 mu plus 1 minus beta H delta L. This is the correct So let's start to think about geometry. I compose a back stress, <coughs> a trial back stress. That back stress, that trial back stress, happens to always be in the right direction. <coughs> That's what we just found out. Its direction is correct. The strength of it is incorrect. The magnitude. So when it overshoots, by a certain amount in the magnitude, it gets corrected by a certain amount that depends on the plasticity. But it also depends on what kind of model you're using. If you're using a isotropic model, beta equals 1. This part drops, and all you get is 2 mu times delta lambda. That sounds awfully familiar to the correction, remember, before. Same if h equals zero. Remember, we did the, 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 the perfect plasticity uh, version, and so on, okay? So be aware of it. Now let's finish this up. Um, question is how? Um, ah, perfect, beautiful, yes. So now we, we, just, we just found out what this first term is. Right, that's this. So I'm going to write my f again. Okay. At n plus 1 equals L2 norm of C at n plus 1 trial minus this whole thing here. Okay. 2 mu plus 1 minus beta H delta lambda. But that's not enough. I need a kappa n plus 1. But kappa or delta kappa, let's say, we were told is h times delta lambda. And then we had a beta in the combined model. So that means that kappa at n plus 1 equals kappa at n plus delta kappa, which is this term. Beta h delta lambda. Right? Let's plug that in here. So this becomes minus kappa n minus beta h delta lambda. All of that has to be equal to zero according to consistency. Let's put this guy together with this guy. And if you had to give it a name, what would you call it? When they're together. Yeah. So this becomes f at n plus 1 equals f at n plus 1 trial minus, <coughs> let's see if I can be clever here. There's a beta h delta lambda. There's a beta h delta lambda. Minus sign becomes positive sign. This is negative. Those two guys <coughs> cancel out. And all you're going to get is this guy. 2 mu delta lambda, that has to be equal to zero. 
In other words, delta lambda, my plasticity, always equals Does that look familiar? It's identical <laughs> to what we had before. Delta lambda was also Fn plus 1 trial over 2 mu. But the only difference is that the F was different. It was L2 norm of S minus kappa. Okay? Yeah. How, you went in terms of 1 minus theta in the parentheses? Ah, yes, 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 yes. I think you're right. I think, you're, I think I'm getting ahead of myself. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're absolutely right. There's a plus H. You're absolutely right. That's the difference. Okay. It only recovers the other model when H is there. Thank you. Yeah. Beta has disappeared, by the way. See that? Beta <coughs> has plays no role here. So let me just give you geometry and let's call it a day. So um, it's been a very nice, very productive lecture. Let's close it up. So let's play with this guy. Always play with the geometry when you have these models, when you're learning a model especially. So put ourselves on the Vittori plane with my one, well let's not even write it. Say we have an initial little surface, alpha zero, we have, so kappa is here, and we have, let's say kappa n. Ah, no, let, my graph is more complex than this, so let's, let's start off. Sorry, let's, let's assume that alpha has evolved, otherwise it's kind of a good point. So let's say we're here to make things different from before. So, of course, just today I left my, <laughs> uh, my ruler that, that Alex gave me. So, here's alpha, and then, this is your kappa, and then, let's assume just for hahas that this is Inside or on the yield surface? Right? Who knows? This boundary is given by F <coughs> equal to zero. What else do we need? That's it. Right? Now we take First thing we know is uh, we, you know, we take a trial state. Let's make it interesting. Let's make it all up. And by the way, how do you call this guy? C N. Very good. So now all of a sudden I appear here. Call it, we can call it SN plus one. Yeah, yeah, no, no, no. So this is this vector. So this minus alpha N 
is C and N plus 1 trunk. Yes or no? Yes or no? Maybe? No? Yes or no? Yeah, that's the definition of C and M plus 1 trial. Here it is. Where is it? Where is it? Where? This guy. Yeah, we called it, right? We define it as S, N plus 1 trial, minus alpha and N. So it's just a definition. It's this guy. Absolutely. Thank you. Yes. So that fixes the direction for C n plus 1, the true version. It has to be along that line. All you can do is expand or contract according to the correct. Okay? We know it's it's parallel. Not only that, we know that its magnitude is just a scale version of the trial. So that means also, so this is alpha n, that means that alpha n at n plus 1 is confined to landing somewhere along that line. Okay, let's just <coughs> land it somewhere. Okay, let's say it lands. Say lands there. So I'm gonna move this guy again. So this is my new alpha and n plus one. Okay. Let's assume that I have expanded a little bit also in in diameter, so let's say that my diameter is now this. So that makes me, that gives me a possibility for my new yield surface, which is this one. Uh, that's not good, it's not centered. So I know it's going to be centered here. bigger than this one, just the shortest one of the combined. Ah, there it is, yeah. Okay, so let's try to re reconstruct the graphic. Um, we pull that apart. So <coughs> this continues to be alpha n plus one. This point here that sets the center for my yield surface. Um, this is now kappa n plus one, which is maybe larger than kappa n. It, it, it has to be. Okay. It, it, H is, is, is greater than zero. Okay, this is alpha n plus one, okay. Then, um, I'm also told, did I write that down? Here. I also know that S, and I would, I, you, you can probably see it from here. Sn equals Sn plus one trial minus some scalar value times this guy is Sn or Cn plus 1 trial over Cn. Okay? So, but, but that's, that's harder to see. Um, I just go by my drawing here. So, took, took, now I know this. 
uh, this guy here, from here, Say something about C. So C is here. Um, we call this guy from here to here. We were calling this guy C and N plus one trial. We made that call. And my C and N plus 1 has to be along that line as well. And that is going to be this guy, isn't it? It has to be, no, 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 no. Oh, no, yeah, 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 that's, that's fine. So here is SN. And this is a mess. This is an S N plus one. This point here. So let's see if you can if it, if I only have color. Uh, let's try to do it in color. So let's put the state of stress in green. The true state of stress. This is the true, the true state of stress. So those are my two state of stresses. <coughs> Sn, Sn plus 1. Let's do the kappas in, the alphas in uh, orange. Here is alpha n. Here is alpha n plus 1. Okay, then uh, same more color. Ah, color. So here is C. Okay. Here is the new C. Just this guy from here to here, from the center to SN plus 1. And then there is this trial guy that is this guy here, but I don't want to draw it. Well, I'm going to draw it superficially here. That guy is what we've been calling, oh, man, no. That's CN plus 1 trial. The guy that takes you from lambda from alpha n to SN plus 1 trial. And the beauty of the algorithm is that this guy and this guy are parallel. So that constrains the whole thing. That constrains your circle, its center to move along that line. So that constrains alpha n plus one to go from alpha n to Sn plus one. Somewhere along that line, you go to map. Okay. And then the rest of it just works out um, geometrically. So the other thing I want to tell you is that this is, of course, magnitude of that and this is the strength of a trial. Okay, and you know how to work out the difference um, here. 
scale cell is this. Okay. But it's not easy to see that geometrically. Essentially, you know, this little bit plus that little bit has to be this. See that? In fact, I am willing to bet that this little bit here is 1 minus beta uh, h delta lambda. And probably this little bit here is uh, 2 mu delta lambda. And this little bit here is is what's left of this thing. <laughs> Looks like one of my daughter's drawings. <laughs>